the papacy, its histories, dogmas, genius, and prospects. Book 2, Dogmas, Chapter 16, of Purgatory. Papists have mapped out the other world into four grand divisions. The lowest is hell, the region of the damned. There are the always burning fires. There are Lutherans and all other Protestant heretics. And in fine, there are all who have died beyond the pale of the Roman Catholic Church, with the exception of a few heathens and a few Christian, whose narrow intellects scarcely serve to distinguish between their right hand and their left, and who have escaped on the ground of invincible ignorance. The next region, in order, is purgatory, of which we shall have occasion to speak more fully immediately. Immediately above purgatory is Limbus Patrum, where the souls of the saints who died before our Savior's time were confined till released by him, and carried with him to heaven at his ascension, when this region was abolished and heaven substituted in its room. The last and remaining region is Limbus and Phantom. To this receptacle, the souls of children dying unbaptized are consigned, it being a settled point among the doctors of the Romish Church that such as die unbaptized are excluded from heaven. It is the lowest, save one of these four localities, of which we are to speak purgatory. It is filled with the same fires and is the scene of the same torments as the region immediately beneath it, but with this important difference, that those consigned to it remain here only for a while. It is the doctrine of the Church of Rome that no one enters heaven immediately on his departure. A short purgation amid the fires of purgatory is indispensable in the case of all, unless perhaps of those who are protected by a very special and most plenary indulgence. Even the pontiffs themselves, infallible though they be, must take purgatory in their way, and pass a certain period amid its fires, before being worthy to appear at those gates at which St. Peter keeps watch. All who die in mortal sin, and of all mortal sins, heresy and the lack of money to buy an indulgence are the most mortal, are at once consigned to hell. Those who die in a state of grace, with the remission of the guilt of all their mortal sins, go to purgatory, where they are purified from the stain of venial sins, and endure the temporary punishment which remains due for their mortal offenses. For it is a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that even after God has remitted the guilt and the eternal punishment of sin, a temporary punishment remains due, which may be borne either in this life or the next. Without this doctrine, it would scarce be possible to maintain purgatory, and without purgatory, who would buy indulgences and masses? And without indulgences and masses... How could the coffers of the Pope be replenished? This sojourn is longer or shorter in purgatory, according to the circumstances, being dependent mainly upon the amount of satisfaction to be given. But the period may be much shortened by the efforts made in behalf of the deceased by his friends on earth. For the Church teaches that souls detained in that state are helped by the suffrages of the faithful, that is, by the prayers and alms offered for them, and principally by the indulgences and masses purchased for their benefit. The existence of purgatory is authoritatively taught and most surely believed among Roman Catholics. The doctrine respecting it decreed by the Council of Trent and taught in the Catechism of that Council as well as in all the common catechisms of the Church of Rome, is that which we have just stated. The Council of Trent decreed, quote, 
that there is a purgatory, close quote, and enjoined all bishops to diligently endeavor that the wholesome doctrine of purgatory be everywhere taught and preached, an injunction which has been carefully attended to. And so important is the belief of purgatory that Cardinal Bellarmine affirms that its denial can be expiated only amid the flames of hell. One would naturally expect that Rome would be very prepared with very solid and convincing grounds for a doctrine to which she assigns such prominence, and which she inculcates upon her people under a penalty so tremendous. These grounds, such as they are, we shall indicate, and that is all our limits permit. The first proof is drawn from the Apocrypha, but as this is an authority that possesses no weight with Protestants, we shall not occupy space with it, but pass on to the second, which is drawn from Scripture, and which is made to support the chief weight of the doctrine, with what justice the reader will judge. The following is the passage in which papists unmistakably discover purgatory. Quote, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Close quote. Here, says the papist, our Lord speaks of a sin that shall not be forgiven in the world to come, which implies that there are sins that shall be forgiven in the world to come. But sins cannot be forgiven in heaven, nor will they be forgiven in hell. Therefore, there must be a third place where sins are forgiven, which is purgatory. The answer which the Reverend Mr. Nolan has given to this is much to the point, and is all that such an argument deserves. Let me suppose, says he, that a person committed a most enormous offense against the laws of this country, and that the Lord Lieutenant said, It shall not be forgiven, neither in this country nor in England. Would any one be so irrational as to argue that the Lord Lieutenant meant to insinuate from this mode of expression that there was a middle place where the crime might be forgiven? That our Lord meant simply to indicate the unpardonable character of the sin against the Holy Ghost, and not to teach the doctrine of purgatory, is incontrovertible from the parallel passage in Luke, where it is said, Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Other passages have been adduced, which yield, if possible, a still more doubtful support to, to purgatory, and on which it were a waste of time here to dwell. The practice of the fathers, some of whom prayed for the dead, has been pled in argument, as if the unwarrantable customs of men, lapsing into superstition, could support a doctrine still more gross and superstitious, and still farther to fortify an opinion which stands in need of all the aid it can obtain from every quarter, and finds all too little. The vision of a Perpetua, a young lady of 22, has been employed to silence those who refuse on this head to listen to the fathers. But if there be indeed a purgatory, and if the belief of it be so indispensable that all are damned who doubt it, as the papists teach, why was it not clearly revealed? And why is the argument in its favor nothing but a miserable patchwork of perverted texts, visions of young ladies, and the dotard practices of men whose Christianity had become emasculated by a nascent superstition? We can trace a purgatory nowhere but in the writings of the pagan philosophers and poets. The great father of poetry makes some not very obscure allusions to such a place. Plato believed in a middle state. It formed one of the compartments of Virgil's Elysium, 
and their souls were purified by their own sufferings and the sacrifices of their friends on earth before entering the habitation of joy. And from this source did the Roman Catholic Church borrow her purgatory. But we have a sure word of prophecy. The world beyond the grave has been made known to us, so far as we are able to receive it, by one who knew it better than either popes or fathers, because he came from it. When he lifts the veil, we discover only two classes and two abodes. And while we meet with nothing in the New Testament that countenances the doctrine of purgatory, we meet with much that expressly contradicts and confutes it. All the statements of the word of God respecting the nature of sin and the death and satisfaction of Christ are condemnatory of purgatory and conclusively establish that there neither is nor can be any such place. The scripture authorizes no distinction as papists make between venial and mortal sins. It teaches that all sin is mortal, and unless blotted out by the blood of Christ, will issue in the sinner's eternal ruin. It teaches that after death there is neither change of character nor of state, that God does not sell his grace, but bestows it freely that we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, and that no man can redeem his brother, whether by prayers or by offerings, and that the law of God demands of every man, every moment of his being, the highest obedience of which his nature and his faculties are capable, and that since the foundation of the world, a single work of superrogation has never been performed, by any of the sons of men, and that, therefore, the source whence this imaginary fraud of merit is supplied has no existence, and is, like the fund itself, a delusion and a fable. It teaches, in fine, that God pardons men only on the footing of the satisfaction of his Son, which is complete and sufficient, and needs not to be supplemented by works of human merit, and that when he pardons, he pardons all sin, and forever. But the grand criterion by which Rome tests all her doctrines is not their truth, nor their bearing on man's benefit and God's glory, but rather their value in money. How much will they bring, is the first question she, which she puts. And it must be confessed that in purgatory she has found a rare device for replenishing her coffers, of which she has not failed to make the very most. We need go no farther than Ireland as an instance. For a poor man, when he dies, a private mass is offered for which the priest is paid from two and six pence to ten shillings. For rich men, there is a high or chanted mass. In this instance, a number of priests assemble, and each receives from seven and six pence to a pound. At the end of the month after the death, mass is again celebrated. The same number of priests again assemble, and receive payment over again. Anniversary or annual masses are also appointed for the rich, when the same routine is gone through, and the same expenses are incurred. There are, moreover, in almost every parish in Ireland, purgatorial societies. The person becomes a member on the payment of a certain sum, and the subscription of a penny a week and the funds thus raised are given to the priest to be laid out for the deliverance of souls from purgatory. There is, besides, All Souls Day, which falls on the 2nd of November, 
on which an extraordinary collection is taken up from all Catholics for the same purpose. In short, there is no end of the expedients and pretenses which purgatory furnishes to an avaricious priesthood for extorting money. And I'll actually take a moment here and say, in the modern day and in the Protestant church, what they do is they extort tithes. The 10% of your gross income is a prerequisite for church membership. Now, when you take that in comparison to what was just read, you can see how almost identical they are. Continuing. Popery, says the author of Kerwin's letters, meets men at the cradle and dogs them to the grave and beyond it with its demands for money. The writer was told in Belgium by an intelligent English Protestant who had resided many years in that country that it is rare indeed for a man of substance to die without leaving from 30 to 50 pounds to be laid out in masses for his soul. No sooner is the fact known then the priests of the district flock to the dead man's house, as, to, do, as do rooks to carrion. And, while a centime of the sum remains, live there, or while a centime of the sum remains, live there, singing masses, and all the while feasting like ghouls. Another of the innumerable frauds connected with purgatory is the doctrine of intention. By this is meant that the priest offers his mass according to the intention of the person paying. And the price varies according to the circumstances of the person, from half a crown to five shillings. These intentions, in many instances, are never discharged. Mr. Nolan mentions the case of the Reverend Mr. Curran, parish priest, uh, parish priest of Kiluchan, in the country of Westmeath, an intimate acquaintance of his own, who at his death bequeathed to the Reverend Dr. Cantwell of Mullinger 300 pounds to be expended on masses at two and six pence each, for the intentions as he, Mr. Curran, had neglected to discharge. And it thus appears that Mr. Curran died owing 2,400 masses, most of them, doubtless, for souls in purgatory. The frauds, says Dr. Murray of New York, addressing Bishop Hughes, the frauds which your church has practiced on the world by her relics and indulgences are enormous. If practiced by the merchants of New York in their commercial transactions, they would send every man of them to state prison. In Roman Catholic countries, says Principal Cunningham, and in Ireland among the rest, the priests make the people believe that by the sacrifice of the Mass, that is, by their offering up to God the body and blood of Christ, they can cure barrenness, heal the diseases of cattle, and prevent mildew in grain, and much money is every year spent in procuring masses to effect these and similar purposes. Men who obtain money in such a way, and upon such pretenses, and this is a main source of the income of popish priests, should be regarded and treated as common swindlers. That actually was a quote by uh, William Cunningham. Chapter 17 of the Worship of Images Two things are here to be determined. First, the practice of the Church of Rome as regards images. And second, the judgment which the Word of God pronounces on that practice. Her practice, so far as pertains to its outward form, is as incapable of being misunderstood as it is of being defended. She sets up images which are representations of saints or of angels or of Christ. And she teaches her members to prostrate themselves before these images, to burn incense, and to pray before them, 
to undertake pilgrimages to their shrine and to expect a more than ordinary answer to the intercessions offered before them. There is not a church in any Roman Catholic country throughout the world where this manner of worship is not every day celebrated. And, being open to all, no concealment is possible, and none is sought. The worshiper enters the cathedral. He selects the image of the saint whom he prefers. He kneels, he counts his beads, he burns his candle, and, it may be, presents his votive offering. As regards the letter of the practice of the Church of Rome, there is not and there cannot be any dispute. These facts being admitted, the controversy might here take end. This is what the Word of God denounces as image worship, which is a violation of the Second Commandment. This it strictly prohibits, and this is enough to substantiate the charge which Protestants have brought against the Church of Rome as being guilty of idolatry. Her practice in this point is manifestly a revival of the pagan worship in one of its grossest and most offensive forms. She, as really as the ancient idolaters, worships the creature more than the creator. But let us hear what Rome has to say in her own behalf. She introduces the element of intention and on this mainly rests her defense. She pleads that she does not believe these images to be inspired with, with the divinity. She does not believe them to be gods. She pleads also that she does not believe that the wood or stone or gold of which they are composed can hear prayer, or that the image of itself can bestow the blessing supplicated for that she believes them only to be images, and therefore directs her worship and prayers past or beyond them to the saint or angel whom the image represents. The papist does not pray to, but through the image. We accept this as a fair statement of what the theoretic practice of the Church of Rome on the subject of images but we reject it as a statement of what the practice is in. Fact. And especially, do we reject it as a defense of that practice? And we do so for the following reasons. In the first place, if the papist is acquitted of idolatry on this ground, there is not an idolater on the face of the earth who may not, on the same ground, demand an acquittal. None but the most ignorant and brutish ever mistook the stock or the stone before which they kneeled for the Creator. And this representative principle, on which the image worshipper of the Popish Church founds his justification, pervaded the whole system of the pagan worship. It was this which led the world astray at the first, and covered the earth with a race of deities of the most revolting character, whether it was the heavenly bodies, as in Chaldea, or a class of demigods, as in Greece and Rome. It was the great first cause that was professedly adored through these symbolizations and substitutes. The vulgar, perhaps, failed to grasp this distinction, or steadily to keep it before them just as the mass of worshippers in the Roman Catholic Church fail practically to apprehend the difference between praying to and praying before, or rather beyond, the image. But such was the system, and that system the Bible denounced as idolatry. And the same system stands equally condemned when found in a popish cathedral as when found in a pagan temple. But, in the second place, it is not true that these images are simple helps to devotion, or mere media for the conveyance of the worship offered before them to the object whom they represent. The homage and honor are given to the image immediately, 
and to the object represented immediately. And the worshiper assuming the power by an act of volition or intention of transferring the honor from the image to the object. But the image is honored and commanded to be so on no less an authority than the Council of Trent. Quote, Moreover, says the Council, let them teach that the images of Christ and of the Virgin, Mother of God, and of other saints are to be had and retained, especially in churches, and due honor and veneration rendered to them. Close quote. And the decree goes on to say that the person is to prostrate himself before the image, to uncover his head before it, and kiss it, no doubt under the pretense that by these marks of honor to the image he is honoring those whose likeness it bears. I want to take a moment and just remind everybody that half of our Supreme Court in the United States are Roman Catholics. So can you imagine people like this bowing before images and practicing sorcery to have in their hands the powers of a judge? Insanity. I continue. This decree reduplicates on a former decree of the Second Council of Nice, held in AD 787, at which the controversy respecting images was finally settled. The Council of Nice decreed that the images of Christ and his saints are to be venerated and adored, though not with true latria, or the worship due exclusively to God. This same doctrine is taught in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. There, such acts of worship, as we have already specified, are recommended to be performed to images, for the sake of those whom they represent. And it is declared that this is highly beneficial to the people, as is also the practice of storing churches with images, not for instruction simply, but for worship. If therefore we find the divines of the Romish church not adhering to their own theory, but blending the image and the object in the same acts of adoration, if we find them expressly teaching that images are to be worshipped, though not with the same supreme veneration that is due to God, how can we expect that this distinction should be observed by the people? By the mass of the people, this distinction is neither understood nor observed. The image is worshipped, and nothing more. That is their deity. And in not one in a thousand cases do the thoughts or intentions of the worshiper go beyond it. Why, out of several images of the same saint, does the worshiper prefer one to the others? Why does he make long pilgrimages to its shrine? Why, but because he believes that a peculiar virtue or divinity resides in this, his favorite image. And this shows that it is more to him than simple wood and stone. There could not be grosser or more wholesale idolatry than the festival of the Bambino at Rome, as described by Seymour. When the priest on the summit of the capital elevates the little wooden doll, which represents the infant savior, the thousands that cover the slope and bottom of the mountain fall prostrate, and nothing is heard but the low sounds of prayer addressed to the image. The Rome of the Caesars never witnessed a more idolatrous spectacle. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is firmly believed that the image possesses miraculous powers. The priests take care to encourage the delusion, and not a day passes without an application for a cure. 
There are numerous images at Rome believed to possess the power of working miracles. Among the rest is that of Mary in Santa Maria Maggiore. This picture was carried in procession through the streets of Rome to suppress the cholera. The Pope, Gregory XVI, joining barefooted in the procession. And what, may we ask, is the change which the Papist believes passes on the image in the act of consecration? Is it not this, that where as before it was simply a piece of dead and inefficacious matter, it has now become filled or inspired with the virtue or divinity of the object it represents? Who is now mysteriously present in it or with it? But in the third place, though this distinction were one that could be easily drawn, and though it could be shown that it always is clearly drawn by the worshiper, and though it could be shown also, that all the good effects which have been alleged do in point of fact flow from this practice. All this would make nothing as a defense. The word of God denounces the practice as idolatrous and plainly forbids it. Again, second commandment, Exodus chapter 20. The condemnation and prohibition of this practice form the subject of one entire precept of the Decalogue. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, etc. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So these words are revoked as plainly and solemnly as they were promulgated. Till the same mighty voice shall proclaim in the hearing of the nations that the second precept of the Decalogue has been abrogated. The practice of Rome must stand condemned as idolatrous. The case, then, is a plain one, and resolves itself into this, whether we shall obey Rome or God. The former, speaking from the seven hills, says, quote, Thou mayest make unto thee graven images, and bow down thyself to them, and serve them, close quote. The latter, speaking in thunder from Sinai, says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them and serve them. Rome herself has confessed that these two commands, that from the seven hills and that from Sinai, are eternally irreconcilable. By blotting them from the Decalogue, the second precept of the law. In other words, the Catholic Bible doesn't have it. Alas, will this avail her aught so long as that precept stands unrepealed in the law of God? May God have mercy upon her poor benighted people, whom she leads blindfolded into idolatry, and may he remember this extenuation of their guilt when he arises to execute judgment upon those who, knowing that they who do such things are worthy of death, not only do them, but teach others to do the same. I'll do one more. Chapter 18 of The Worshipping of Saints the next branch of the idolatry of the Roman Catholic Church is her worship of dead men. These she denominates saints. Of this numerous and miscellaneous class, some unquestionably were saints, 
as the apostles and others of the early Christians. And others may be accounted in the judgment of charity to have been saints. But there are others which figure in the calendar of Roman apotheosis, of whom no stretch of charity will allow us to believe were saints. They were unmistakable fanatics, and their fanaticism was far indeed from being of a harmless kind. It drew in its wake, as fanaticism not unfrequently does, gross immorality and savage and unnatural cruelty. In the list of Romish divines or divinities, we find the names of persons whose very existence is apocryphal. And there are others whose incorrigible stupidity, laziness, and filth rendered them unfit to herd even with brutes. And there are even others who, little to the world's comfort, were neither stupid nor inactive, but who made themselves busy, much as a fiend would, in inventing instruments of torture and founding institutions for destroying mankind and devastating the earth. St. Dominic, for instance, the founder of the Inquisition. Prayers offered to such persons and directed to heaven run some risk of missing those of whom they are in quest. But the question here is, granting all the individuals of this promiscuous crowd to have been saints, is it right to pray to them? We do not charge the Church of Rome with teaching that these saints are gods, or are able by their own power to bestow the blessings for which their votaries pray. The Church of Rome distinguishes between the worship which it is warrantable to offer to the saints, and the worship that is due to God. The former are to be worshipped with dulia, the latter with latria. God is to be worshipped with supreme veneration. The saints are to be venerated in an inferior degree. They occupy in heaven, that church teaches, stations of dignity and influence, and on this ground, as well as on account of their eminent virtues while they lived, they are entitled to our esteem and reverence. It may be reasonably supposed, moreover, that they have great influence with God, and that, moved partly by pity for us, and partly by the homage we render to them, they are inclined to use that influence in our behalf. Man, crazy. We ought therefore, or we ought therefore, says that church, to address prayers to them, that they may pray to God for us, in other words, to make them intermediaries. This, then, is the function which the Church of Rome assigns to departed saints. They present the prayers of supplicants to God, and intercede with God in their behalf. They are intercessors of mediation, though not of redemption. We have one mediator, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. One. I continue. But the Church of Rome has been little careful accurately to state her theory on this head. Little careful to impress upon the minds of her people that the only service they are to expect at the hands of the saints is that of intercession. She has used expressions of a vague character, if not purposely designed, yet obviously fitted, to seduce, to gross idolatry. Nay, she allows and sanctions idolatry by teaching that saints may be the objects of a certain sort of veneration, namely, dulia, and instituting a distinction which is utterly beyond the comprehension of the common people. So that, in point of fact, there is no difference between the worship which they offer to the saints and the worship which they offer to God, unless, perhaps, that the former is the more devout and fervent, as it is certainly the more customary of the two. In the papal church, millions pray to the saints who never bow a knee to God. The Council of Trent teaches that the saints who reign together with Christ offer their prayers to God for men, and that it is a good and useful thing, suppliantly to invoke them and to flee to their prayers, help and assistance, and that they are impious men 
who maintain the contrary. The caution of the council will not escape observation. It teaches the dogma, but does not expressly enjoin the practice. It is usual for papists to take advantage of this in arguing with Protestants, and to affirm that the Church has not enjoined or commanded prayers to saints. While this may be true in theory, but not in practice. Prayers to saints form part and parcel of her liturgy, so that no man can join in her worship without joining in these prayers, and thus she practically compels the thing. Moreover, they are obliged, under the penalty of being guilty of a mortal sin, to celebrate certain fetes, those who, for instance, of the Assumption of the Virgin and All Saints Day. The Catechism of Trent teaches that we may pray to the saints to pity us, and if we join this with the assistance and help on which we are encouraged to cast ourselves, and if we add the grounds on which we are taught to look for such help, namely that the saints occupy stations of dignity and influence in heaven, we will feel perfectly satisfied that the Church of Rome is very willing that her people should believe that the function of the saints goes a very considerable way beyond simple intercession, and that the worship of which they are the objects should be regulated accordingly. This idea is strengthened by the fact that the Roman Missal teaches that there are blessings bestowed upon us for the merits of the saints. Of such sort is the following prayer, quote, O God, who, to recommend to us innocence of life, was pleased to let the soul of thy blessed virgin Scholastica ascend to heaven in the shape of a dove, granted by her merits and prayers, that we may lead innocent lives here and ascend to eternal joys hereafter. Close quote. We add another example from the Misal. Quote, may the intercession, O Lord, of Bishop Peter, thy apostle, render the prayers and offerings of thy church acceptable to thee, that the mysteries we celebrate in his honor may obtain for us the pardon of our sins. Close quote. But it matters little what is the exact amount of influence and power attributed to the saints by Roman Catholics, or what the refinements and distinctions by which they attempt to justify the worship they pay to them. Their practice is undeniable. And in the same place where God is worshipped, and with the same forms, do Roman Catholics pray to the saints to pray to God in their behalf. Monsieur Peroni distinctly says that the saints, on the ground of their excellence, are the just objects of religious worship, and that if we reserve sacrifices, vows, and temples to God, we may approach the saints with prostration and prayer. Images and relics, he says, receive an improper worship and adoration, which passes through them through to their prototypes. Not so the veneration paid the saints, which is not relative but absolute. Tried by the implicit principles and the express declarations of the Bible, this practice is idolatry. There is not, either in the Old or in the New Testament, a solitary instance of such a worship. Nay, on those occasions on which we find worship attempted to be offered to the saints, it was promptly and indignantly rejected. No doubt we are commanded to pray with and for one another as is often pleaded by papists. But there is a wide difference between this and praying to the dead. The vision in the Apocalypse 
of the elders with the vials full of odors, which are said to be the prayers of saints, though often paraded by Roman Catholics as an unanswerable proof, has no bearing upon the point. Commentators on the Revelation have shown by very conclusive reasonings that the vision has no relation to heaven, but to the church on earth. And papists must overthrow this interpretation before the passage can be of any service to their cause. Right reason and the express declaration of scripture combine in testifying that God alone is the object of worship and that we cannot offer prayer or perform an act of adoration to any other being, however exalted, without incurring the highest criminality. Quote, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Close quote. It doesn't get any simpler. The reply of our Lord to the tempter seems purposely framed so as to include both Latria and Dulia. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. On the principles of the Roman Catholic Church, it is quite possible for a man to be saved without having performed a single act of devotion to God in his whole life. He has simply to entrust the saints with his case, who will pray for him, and with better success than he himself could obtain. And the tendency, not to say the design, of the Romish system is to withdraw our hearts and our homage altogether from God, and under an affectation of humility to banish us forever from the throne of God's grace, and sink us in the worship of stocks and of dead men. And manifestly, the popish divinities are but the resuscitation of the gods of the pagan mythology. Venus still reigns under the title of Mary, and Jupiter under that of Peter. And so, as regards the other gods and goddesses of the heathen world, their names have been changed, but their dominion is prolonged. The same festivals are kept in commemoration of them. This same rites are celebrated in their honor, slightly altered to suit the modern state of things, and the same powers are ascribed to them. Like their pagan predecessors, they have their shrines, and like them too, they have their assigned limits within which they exercise jurisdiction, and their favorites and votaries over whom they keep special guard. Papists have been often asked to explain how it is that the saints in heaven are able to bear the, or hear the prayers of mortals on earth. Well, they do not affirm that the saints are either omnipotent or omniscient. And yet, unless they are both, it is difficult to understand how they can know what we feel or hear what we say at so great a distance. Thousands are continually praying to them in all parts of the earth. They have suppliants at Rome, at New York, at Peking, and yet, though but men and women, they are supposed to hear every one of these petitions. And the difficulty does indeed seem a formidable one, and though often pressed to explain it, Roman Catholics have given as yet no solution but what is utterly subversive of the idea on which the system is founded. They usually tell us that the saints acquire the knowledge of these supplications through God. Well, according to this theory, the prayer first descends to God. God then tells it to the saints, and the saints pray it back again to God. But what becomes of the boasted advantage of praying to the saints? And why not address our prayers directly to God? Why not go to God at once, seeing it turns out that he alone can hear us in the first instance, and that, but for his subsequent revelation of our prayers, they would be dissipated in empty space, 
and those powerful intercessors, the saints, would know nothing at all of the matter. You, said Mr. Seymour to a priest at Rome, who had favored him with this notable solution of the difficulty, quote, You make the Virgin Mary and the saints mediators of prayer. According to this system, God is our mediator to the saints, and not the saints our mediators to God, close quote. The path is strangely circuitous. Far too circuitous to be the right one. Nothing could be happier than the illustration of Coleridge, with special reference to the Virgin. It is that of an individual of whom we wish to obtain a favor, and whose mother we employ to intercede for us. The man hears well enough himself, but his mother is deaf. So we tell him to tell her that we wish her to pray to him to bestow on us the favor we desire. I'm going to go ahead and stop there on that one. Anyway, madness, folks. Utter madness and insanity. And to think so many people in positions of power, and not just the United States, but in in England, or the United Kingdom, Europe, Australia, all over the globe. These people who are Roman Catholics are actually doing this stuff, praying to images, like sorcerers or something. It's madness. Anyway, that's it for today. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless and preserve each and every one of you who have persevered thus far in the narration of the papacy, its history, dogmas, genius, and prospects. See you next time.